Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a new YouTube channel I have felt inspired to start. And the emphasis on it is going to be premise, conclusion, argumentation. I don't know if you've ever taken a philosophy course, but you might learn premise, conclusion, argumentation if you do take a philosophy course. Essentially, it's a very formal way of arguing. So sometimes when we argue with our friends, family, whoever, you know, we speak, we speak blobs of text, right? Text just comes out of our mouth. That's our arguments, more in paragraph format. Uh, and that's okay. I want to assess a certain argument today on abortion in premise conclusion format. Now give you an idea of what I mean. Let me show you the benefit of premise conclusion arguments. It's the best way to argue because it allows you to break down an argument into its fundamental components. You have premises and then you have a conclusion. And if you can take an argument that's in paragraph form and extract from that um, the premises and conclusion, then you understand the argument. I would, I would say that if you can't do that, if you cannot put an argument in a premise conclusion format, you might not really know what the argument is. And it's very hard to do. It's not, it's not necessarily easy. It requires sort of an understanding of logic, mathematical logic, but it is a beautiful way to argue, and I wish it was done more often. I think the, the world needs this desperately. I mean, it's done in philosophy circles, some, but I don't see it as much as I would love to see it. Because when you take an argument and you put it in a premise conclusion format, some arguments that seem good on the surface completely might topple. And other arguments might seem gain some strength. Uh, so let me just get, give an example of a premise conclusion argument. I got this notepad file open here, uh, so I'm going to type in this. So usually you want to like number your premises, right? I'm going to say premise one. Anything, if something, I'm going to say if something is big, then it is scary. Okay, that's premise one. Premise two, lions, let's go with elephants. Elephants are big. So you have these two premises, then you're going to have a conclusion. The conclusion is a result of the premises. It's a logical result. So let me say, therefore, elephants are scary. Okay, this is a premise conclusion argument. And I will show you what it looks like in mathematical symbolic notation. So the idea is these arguments you can sort of reduce down to mathematical symbols. Now I'm going to do that right here. So premise one is basically if 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 a or if something belongs in maybe the best way to say it is if something meets condition a, then it is b. Premise two, elephants. We would say elephants meet condition A. Therefore, elephants are B. So in this case, you take A here. What is A? Condition A is being big. B here is being scary. And so these premise conclusion arguments can be broken down into this symbolic logic. And you know, I'm not a professional philosopher. I've taken some philosophy courses when I was in college. I'm an electrical engineer by trade, but I also do computer programming as part of that. And it's very applicable because when you do computer programming, you do stuff like this. You have logic. You have, if this happens, then do this. This is how computers work. They follow a rigid logical structure. If your argument follows a rigid logical structure, it is very beneficial for people to understand what you're actually trying to argue. So I think this, uh, hopefully that just makes some sense. You might think, oh, that's the simplest looking premise conclusion argument. Sometimes all you need is to understand the basics and you can go from there. Uh, that's how I am with lots of things. I, I think anybody can do this. I do not think you need to be a professional philosopher. 
you just need to think about arguments a lot. You need to really assess them. So I'm going to um, take a look here at an article on CNN. It is on abortion. And so it's talking about two Christians here, both who are on opposite sides of the abortion debate. In this article, as you can see, this is um, usually how arguments are in articles. You'll find lots of paragraphs, 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 paragraphs. And so what I want to do is I want to just assess this. This is something you can do. And I'm just going to do this with you. Assess this and see their two arguments, but try to extract from them the premises and the conclusion. And you'll find that it can be harder than you think. So we're going to start with um, Trent Horn here. We're going to come right down to here. It says, how does your faith shape your position on abortion? Let's read this paragraph here and try to figure out his main argument. So he says, my faith informs me that God created human beings in his image. He loves human beings and he wants us to share in that same love and promote justice towards every other human being. Since my faith teaches me that every single human being, every single member of our species is equal in value and dignity, then my faith informs me that I should never directly kill an innocent member of our species just because they're unwanted. My faith informs me that every single human being, from the moment they're conceived until the moment they die, deserves equal protection under the law. Okay, uh, that's a lot of a lot of stuff uh, in that paragraph there. So we all say, like, what is what is the main argument here? And certainly, if you go beyond, he talks about more stuff. But I think within this paragraph here, there is an argument. And we want to extract it and put it into premise-conclusion format. Okay, so I'm going to delete this here. And sometimes you just have to sit with this stuff. I, you know, I apologize that in this video, sometimes it looks like I don't know what I'm doing and I'm just thinking about it. It's because I don't necessarily know what I'm doing right away and I'm thinking about it. We got to do that. We, we can't be so fast always to um, think that we understand something. We have to chew on things. We have to take time and, and really wrestle with this stuff because it does take time. And I tried making a video of this last night actually, but unfortunately I <laughs> had my, my face was cutting off my text file here. So I was typing and you couldn't see it. So I'm remaking this and it took me a while to um, think of those arguments that were being made to, to comprehend them, I should say. But I'm going to try to do it again here. So, first let's find the conclusion of the argument. Um, that might give us a good start, okay? I think the conclusion is about right here. It says, my faith informs me that I should never directly kill an innocent member of our species just because they're unwanted. I would say that is probably the conclusion, but th there's an implied conclusion here. The implied conclusion is that abortion is this, right? Uh, he's against abortion. So it's implied that he's saying abortion is the direct killing of an innocent member of our species. Just Now he, interestingly enough, I know this is something, he, he puts here just because they're unwanted. Well, it's true that in the situation I would, I would think we're you do that just because they're unwanted that yes that would be wrong but I think uh, Trent would also agree in fact I know he does that there's even if that's not the reasoning for the direct killing of an innocent member of our species like maybe someone saying oh it's not because they're unwanted it's because I just for my own mental sanity I need to get rid of this innocent member of the human species I think Trent would also agree that's not moral so but he says it here so let's let's include it in our argument so we could say that's the conclusion i'm going to come down here and write this as the conclusion okay i'm going to in fact just copy and paste this I'm going to change I with one. One should never directly kill an innocent member of our species just because they're unwanted. We want to phrase this in a way uh, that's a little better. We should probably say something like the direct 
killing of an innocent member of, instead of our, let's say the human species, because that's what he's talking about, the human species, just because they're unwanted, is immoral. Okay. That makes sense. I think, um, actually, and that wouldn't be the, that would not be the conclusion. That would be a premise. Okay. The conclusion is implied, as I was saying. The conclusion is that, well, the conclusion he's making is that abortion is immoral. See, sometimes with arguments, actually, the, the main things can be implied or not so explicitly stated. Uh, so almost with anything, you have to assess assumptions. The point of premise conclusion arguments is, is you, you want to minimize the amount of assumptions that are made. You want your argument to be as clear as it could be so that it can't be misinterpreted. You, you, yeah, you want to reduce the amount of interpretations that it can bear, okay? So I, I would say the conclusion is abortion is immoral. That's what he's arguing for in this article. And with, within this paragraph here, he, he mentions this as a premise, that, that the direct killing of an innocent member of the human species just because they're unwanted is immoral. So I think, um, so if we look further down in this paragraph, he says, my faith informs me that every single human being from the moment they're conceived until the moment they die deserves equal protection under the law. So there's a lot actually going on here, a lot in his, um, we might get a couple premises out of this. So first is that a human, from the moment of conception, what comes into existence, what, the being is a human being. Uh, it is a being. That's that's his argument there. Okay. So we could say, like I said, sometimes you gotta think about this. If you can see. I think before that, though, the other implication is that so th this this thing here of because they're unwanted is throwing a little bit of a hatchet into it. Um, it's making it a little bit complicated. So, we, nobody would define abortion as only abortion if the reason for it is because they're unwanted. People, um, but because that's his argument, I'm going to keep it here. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Abortion versus... Willing an abortion because is unwanted is Okay, so willing an abortion to will to commit abortion because the member is unwanted is the direct killing of an innocent member of the human species is just because they're unwanted. I think that uh, seems to be what he's arguing. Now, if premise two is, if premise one is true and premise two is true, conclusion would have to be true. So let's talk about valid versus sound arguments. Valid arguments are ones that are logically uh, performed with proper syntax. So the idea is, uh, it, it's not a debate really whether an argument is valid. Uh, that can be assessed by a logician, okay? And a sound argument is one that is valid and all of the premises are true, therefore, the conclusion must be true, right? If, the if it's valid and, and the premises are true, the conclusion is guaranteed to be true by virtue of logic. So this argument here, um, we could break this down so far into symbolic form. 
and um, checking on the time. Seems to be good. Okay. Turn this one here. An action. Condition A is immoral. Okay. Premise two. B meets condition A. B is immoral. I should use the word therefore. I like to make my like, conclusions with the word therefore. It's got some power to it. Therefore, B is immoral. How does this work here? First, you want to identify what your symbols are. An action that meets condition A. What is condition A? Condition A is the direct killing of an innocent member of the human species just because they're unwanted. That's what A is representing, okay? Premise two, and it's saying A is immoral. So what's highlighted is equivalent to A, it's essentially. This is saying that B meets condition A. What is B? B is willing an abortion because the number is unwanted. So we're saying there's an equivalence there, right? That's what premise two is saying. This word is, when you see the word is, it's very important. That often means mathematical equivalence. So we're saying that willing an abortion because the number is unwanted, B is a. We're saying B is A. And now, if B is A, okay, and we could, instead of saying B meets condition A, I mean, we could say something like B equals A for better understandability. We, we can even say just A is immoral, right? And we say, therefore, B is immoral. Because if A is B and A is immoral, then B is immoral, right? So when you do premise conclusion argumentation, um, what you really want to do is actually you want to, your premises, you want to argue with things that people tend to agree on. And by logic, virtue of logic, uh, lead them to a conclusion which is only reasonable then. Which they may not see on the surface unless they process this premise conclusion argument. So you see, this is actually a pretty uh, simple argument. I think there's still more going on in this paragraph though. Because one the, the, Here's one of the things though. He says, he talks about from the moment of they're conceived until the moment they die, deserve equal protection to the law. So there's a really big um, argument here that from the moment of conception, you have a human being. Now, in this argument, this is an assumption. This is part of the premise, right? It's saying, premise two is saying, willing an abortion because the member is unwanted is the direct killing of an innocent member of the human species. Now, in your argument, you always want to find what the weakest part of your argument is. I would say most people are probably going to find a way to disagree here with premise two, okay? So that's the weakest part of it. you can do a couple of things. One is you can expand this argument. Okay, how would you expand this argument? You could add more premises to show that from conception, someone is an innocent member of the human species. Okay. You can make a sub argument. So you can have separate arguments. Sometimes that's easier. If you've done computer programming before, uh, sometimes you can separate things out into functions. It's a little more understandable instead of having everything in one big block of text. That's another way to do it. Um, I think for this, I'm going to add more premises though. Let's make this a little bit bigger. In fact, the ones I have to add might come earlier. So we want to show, as he's arguing here, from the moment of conception, we want to show that from the moment of conception, something is an innocent member of the human species. So let's start with something that most people agree on. We might want to actually rewrite premise two. 
Let's put it off to the side a bit and just rewrite it. Well, let's say an abortion is the direct killing of an organism, okay? Existence at conception within okay so we might say something like this many people might disagree with this some people, a lot of people might agree with this an abortion is direct killing of an organism that came into existence at conception okay we should probably specify we're talking about a human organism here. Um, human organism. I'm sorry, if I moved. I hope I didn't cut my text off again. Okay. We might do premise three here. We have to show that a human organism that comes into existence at conception is an innocent member of the human species. So we might say something like this. Anything which is alive, growing, and has human parents, uh, actually let's say has human parents and is unborn is an innocent member of the human species. Okay, then we can say a human organism. Now, notice you want you want to use the same language when you do these, right? A human organism that came into existence at conception. That's the same language I use in premise two. Human organism that came into existence at conception. This helps your argument to be clear, okay? I'm going to say a human organism that came into existence at conception is alive, growing, as human parents, and is unborn. So now we're going to have like a sub conclusion within our argument. In conclusion here, premise five is more of a, a conclusional premise. And I'm gonna change this premise. Therefore, therefore, by mathematical equivalence, we would say a human organism that came to existence at conception is an innocent member of human species. All right. So this is a this is a more powerful argument now. Okay, we're gonna try and put it back into a, a logical format. So we premise one is still A is immoral. Okay, look at premise two. An abortion is B, right? We're saying an abortion is B is what the direct killing of a human organism that came into existence at conception. Okay. We say anything which that meets condition C is well, let's change from abortion is the killing of B. And here in premise we say anything that meets condition C is B. So in premise two here, B represents a human organism that came into existence at conception. Oh no, no, no I, I, I screwed that up. Okay. We gotta say that anything that meets condition C is D. What is D? D is an innocent member of the human species. And we should say premise A the killing of 
D is immoral, right? Premise four, okay. A human organism that came into existence at conception. So now we're saying that B meets condition C, okay? So five here, therefore, because B meets condition C, we would say B equals D, All right? We're saying that this organism is an instant member of the human species because and because that's the case, we would say I'm, I'm going to take away the word rolling here. I'm just going to say well, that's fine. Remember, so what is the direct killing of innocent members of the species? Well, here we say E the killing of D. Actually, I would just say is abortion is the killing of D. Therefore, an abortion is immoral. Why? Well, because the killing of D is immoral. What is D? D is an innocent member of the human species. All right. I guess you could say, I guess you'd have to say just because they're unwanted. I think you get the point though here. <clears throat> the killing of D is immoral. Premise, premise two, an abortion is the killing of B. So we're, we're not, this time we're not jumping the gun. When it was the two premise argument, we really jumped the gun, okay. But now we're saying that abortion is a direct killing of a human organism. Instead of referring to it as a human species, we say. So someone might be more agreeable with this. They say, yeah, okay. They don't see a problem with killing a human organism, but they see a problem with killing a member of the human species. Then we have to show that a human organism is a human species. That's what Trent would argue here. So we say, okay, anything which is alive, growing, and has human appearance and is unborn is an innocent member of the human species. This was not in his argument. Uh, this is something, though, I have heard, uh, credit to Matt Fratt, I've heard him argue along these lines before. So that's three. Anything which meets condition C, what is condition C? Alive growing, has human appearance, and it's unborn. We're saying that is D. And because B meets condition C, then B is D. Okay, that those are premises four and five. Because B is D, wherever you see D, you, or wherever you see, you see B, you should be able to substitute them with one another. You do substitution, because B equals D, right? This is mathematics. So the killing of D is immoral, okay? And abortion is the killing of B. That means abortion is also the killing of D, which means abortion is immoral. So that is the argument right there. That is the, the premise conclusion argument. Now you can even you can always expand these things even more. You want to expand more. Um, someone might say, "Well, wh you gotta find again. Look at your premises. Where will someone disagree?" Okay, someone might uh, disagree with abortion being killing. All right, they might disagree with this. They're gonna say, "No, abortion is not the killing of D because abortion isn't killing at all." So we can expand the argument more, right? We could add more premises. And in fact, this premise might come later now. So let's rewrite this a bit. <coughs> add to it. Now, we're, now we can say something along these lines. Okay. Um, Species. I gotta think about it a bit. It's okay to think about these things. 
we want to define killing. That's the idea. Killing is, and I do give Trent Horn some credit for this. Taking of a life, no, the deliberate, is the deliberate, um, let's say killing is a deliberate action to take something, living to a non-living state. I would say that's a fairly good definition of killing, right? You would say, okay, abortion is we would say that, right? Abortion is is that abortion is killing. This will become premise nine, okay. Let's, let's look at our logic again. Six is this. Killing is E. Abortion is E. Therefore, abortion is killed. Right? So we have three more premises to try to make that argument a little more solid, right? So that's how you do this stuff in premise conclusion format. You gotta add premises and make some solid arguments. All right, so I think, uh, in interestingly enough, we took uh, Trent Horn's argument, we just sort of expanded upon it a bit. Uh, but here we have a, a nine premise argument. And again, I'm not a professional philosopher. I enjoy philosophy. I took one philosophy in course in college where we went over premise conclusion argumentation. If you have a mind for logic, you can do this though. But I don't sell yourself short. Don't underestimate your ability to do this. I think it's very important. The world really needs argumentation in this format because it really stretches your mind and allows you to th think more. But um, yeah, I know I know Trent, um, his argument was in paragraph form and we tried to extract from it um, any implications. Uh, we tried to try to extract his main argument. Uh, you, you might say that the reason, th there's another argument in here for why you should never directly kill an innocent member of the, the species is because of their value and dignity. I, I think that's in here too, but we didn't uh, sketch that out. Because if someone disagrees with premise one, we would need to make another sub-argument or add more premises to show that killing an innocent member of the human species because they're unwanted is immoral. And why is that? We would say because an innocent member of the human species um, has value and dignity. Okay, that was fun. Let's move on to maybe the next argument. So I'm gonna tab down here. We're gonna go on to, uh, let me look at her name again. Laura Ellis, let's see what she has to say here. And try to extract her argument. And um, I, th I think that's one of the things. Sometimes when you read arguments in paragraph format, they can seem very enticing, but when you put them into premise conclusion format, um, which, which can be hard to do, you, you see them but just a lot more clearly, and it really helps. So let's see what Alice says. She says, I do believe in the sanctity of human life, and I would love to see a world with less abortions, but I also know that banning abortion is going to most harshly affect people in society who are already really marginalized. And rich white women are always going to be able to have access to safe, affordable abortion. Making abortion legal is going to disproportionately affect young women, women in poverty, women in color, women in, in rural areas, women who don't have a support system that some people are privileged to have. These are the kind of people that Jesus was always advocating for in his life and ministry. At first and foremost, I'm always going to side with a living, breathing human woman, what's best for her and for her family situation. Now there's a lot in here again, so we want to we want to look at how we can turn this into premise conclusion format. What we did with Trent was we first identified his conclusion, which was um, well his conclusion was more implied, but he pointed out the direct killing of an innocent member is, is immoral, and the implication was that abortion is that. Okay, so let's try to extract our argument here. 
It can be hard. Well, we know what her conclusion is, right? I think she's arguing that. Well, it's kind of interesting, actually, because she says, I would love to see a world with less abortions. So she's not arguing so much for the morality of abortion. She's arguing more for, I, I guess, for the practicality of it being legalized. So I'd say the conclusion... Whereas Trent is, Trent is arguing more just about it's immoral, and I, I guess I guess you could follow Trent's argument to say it should be illegal. Um, why should it be illegal? I guess you wouldn't say something being immoral is not enough for it to be illegal, right? Because there's lots of immoral things that we don't necessarily think should be illegal. But I think it would be because he would he would argue further. I think you could just say I think you'd take premise one. The, and say the direct killing of an innocent member of the human species, you could replace is immoral with should be illegal. And I think the argument could, could work out that way. So she, so um, her argument here, brings it down. Laura Ellis's argument, I'd say her conclusion is abortion should be legal. Okay, let's see how she tries to get to that conclusion. Let's find what her argument is. Okay. So I think the main thing is, she seems to be saying, this seems to be the crux of her argument here. Okay, what I've highlighted. Which is a lot. Um, banning abortion is going to most harshly affect people in society who are re already really marginalized. And rich white women are always going to have, be able to have access to safe, affordable abortion. So it's kind of interesting because she said that banning abortion, if abortion's banned, women will still have access to safe, affordable abortion. Um, I don't know how that would be if it was banned, but I don't know. I haven't studied that. I think it'd still be illegal, but maybe maybe there'd be a way for rich white women to, to still access it where people who are marginalized couldn't, I don't know. But that's part of the argument, so we gotta we got think about that. Uh, there's various things going on here. I think this one uh, is fairly difficult um, to, to extract, let's see. Okay, I think the main argument here is <clears throat> Ending of a law, right? I would I would call this the ending of a law, right? Because it's I, I don't know I'm not a lawyer or a politician, but I'm going to say if the ending of a law will result in a negative, disproportionate, negative effect. On then the law should not be ended. I think that's her premise, right? And then it's something along the lines of abortion abortion maybe I should say well The forbidden by law, and the currently permitted act, result in Okay. Or I guess the thing is um I, I need to change this here. Say then the act should 
have the four billion battle. Okay. So really the conclusion would be therefore abortion should not be forbidden by law. So I think let, let's look at this argument. And just like with Trent's argument, we start small here. Okay. If the forbidding by law of a currently permitted act that is a will result something that the law permits you to do okay um, if you want to go in an elevator spin in circles and sing a song a public elevator sure you can do that it's a permitted act so if the forbidding of a currently permitted act will result in a disproportionate negative effect on the marginalized then the act should not be forbidden by law okay some might agree with this premise some might say well there's certain situations but I think that's what she's arguing here right because here she says, um, and I don't. I want to represent the argument as best as possible. I know that banning abortion is going to most harshly affect people in society who are already really marginalized. I think that's the crux of our argument here, right? And rich white women are going to have access to safe, affordable abortion. So she might be saying, <coughs> yeah, that's why I say disproportionate negative effect on the marginalized. You might also say, and also benefits the wealthy or something. <clears throat> I think it's along the same lines, okay? And she says, yeah, so she's saying making abortion illegal. So she is arguing, not so much for the morality, but the legality of abortion is going to disproportionately affect, uh, and she lists people here, young women, women in poverty, women of color, rural areas, women who don't have a support system. It's basically marginalized we can take this highlighted text here and just say marginalized people okay so i think i think this is her main argument let me say premise to the forbidding by law of abortion will result in a disproportionate negative effect on the marginalized therefore abortion should not be forbidden by law okay let's break this down into a logical format Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of how to symbolically represent this. Should be not be a forbidden by law. Well, A I didn't know how to symbolically represent the whole forbidding by law part, so that's why I typed that out. The forbidding by law, abortion, is condition A. Maybe it made a it. No, I don't think I need that. Okay. It's assumed the assumption here is that abortion is an action, right? That's the assumption we're making. You can get really nitpicky with language. At some point, you gotta say, okay, it's good enough. People understand what I'm saying. Conclusion here. Therefore, and Conclusion is the same. So the forbidding of by law of an action will meet condition A. What is condition A? We gotta identify that. That is 
result in a disproportionate negative effect on the marginalized, then the act should not be forbidden by law. Okay, that's condition A. We're saying forbidding by law of abortion meets condition A, therefore abortion should not be forbidden by law. I'm trying to assess it, see if I could symbolically represent it a little better. I feel like there's still a lot of text for symbolic notation. Uh, this is, I think, her main argument here. All right. And I think where are, the, where are some of the weaker points in? Well, let's look, make sure we, we didn't miss anything very important. Um, she's arguing more here. And actually, I got to go to work.